More on the president's displays of authoritarianism, I'm joined by Masha Gessen, a staff writer at The New Yorker, who you'll recall wrote a piece called Autocracy Rules for Survival Two Days After Trump Was Elected This Week. The piece I mentioned earlier, Donald Trump's fascist performance. And Masha, I want to read back just, um, and you also have a new book called Surviving Autocracy, which is about this theme. Um, I want to read to you uh, this paragraph from your latest because it captured a thing that I had been struggling to say all week. Uh, and, and the reason I've been struggling to say it is because there's two things at play here. There are these frankly terrifying images of authoritarianism and authoritarian impulses commanded by a man who is so weak and pathetic and such an incompetent doofus that it can be hard to take seriously. And so this is what you said. Trump is now performing his idea of power as he imagines it. In his intuition, power is autocratic. It affirms the superiority of one nation and one race. It asserts total domination, and it mercilessly suppresses all opposition. Whether or not he is capable of grasping the concept, Trump is performing fascism. What does that mean? Um, well, you know, I've tried not to use the word fascism to describe Trump, in part, not because it's not appropriate, but be, in part because it's a word that that is slippery, that we throw, uh, throw about too much. But it's time that we use this word. And the reason it's time is because Trump is so clearly deploying uh, the visual and rhetorical symbols of fascism, right? It is the symbol of, it, it, visually he I think imagines that power looks like unidentified men in full combat uniform in front of the Lincoln Memorial with the columns, right? That even the architecture of it lends itself to this sort of fascist image. Right. Um, I think it looks like Black Hawk helicopters uh, uh, hovering over protesters. It looks like tear gas. It looks like overwhelming force. And of course, it sounds like overwhelming force as well. He perseverates on the word dominate on his in his phone call with, with, um, with governors. He talks about sending in the military. Uh, does he know that that is fascism? Does he care? It doesn't matter. This is his idea of power. He has signaled this many times before. He has expressed his uh, endless admiration for the autocrats of the world. And now he's making a, he's performing this, he's making a claim to this kind of power. And a power grab always begins as a performance of sorts. There's always a claim made. Mm -hmm. And if it's accepted, if the performance is believed, then it takes hold. And we're at that critical moment now. What you said about his belief clearly in this as I mean, what's striking is that this is a, the president, I don't think, believes in a lot of things other than that people should talk about Donald Trump. But but this is one of his beliefs. This is Mar this is an interview in March 1990 uh, about Tiananmen Square. Now, at the you know, you couldn't really find a bunch of Americans on the side of the Chinese Communist Party when it came to Tiananmen Square. But in that tiny minority was Donald Trump saying when the students poured in Tiananmen Square, the Chinese government almost blew it. Then they were vicious. They were horrible. They put it down with strength. That shows you the power of strength. Our country is right now perceived as weak as being spit on by the rest of the world, basically saying what we need more is more Chinese Communist Party tanks rolling into Tiananmen. That he thinks that political power is brute force. Uh, again, he's made that perfectly clear over and over. But he also thinks that protest. And this idea he shares with the autocrats of the world, uh, one whom I covered for a long time, Vladimir Putin, the idea that protest is chaos, that protest is the opposite mm. of political power, because political power is control. And that protest is the ultimate challenge to political power, and political power needs to be asserted in response to protest. This, th There's another sort of um commonality here with autocrats, which is the sort of threat of the fifth column, right? That there is an internal enemy uh, that is seeking to subvert the state. Um, we've heard the president talk about talk about what he's seeing as domestic terrorism, classifying he and William Barr, domestic terrorism, putting it at least rhetorically and conceptually on a plane with ISIS or Al-Qaeda murdering 3,000 Americans, talking about people, you know, breaking into stores and looting. And we've got this, of course, from, from uh, Ken Klippenstein, who's a great investigative reporter, that the FBI's own internal documents find no intel indicating Antifa, which is, of course, the sort of uh, uh, the great boogeyman here, involvement in the in the violence that happened on Sunday. But this rhetoric of domestic terrorism, this this focus on Antifa, again, 
it's buffoonish at one level and dangerous at the other. What do you make of it? The creation of internal enemies, the creation of these boogeymen is um, uh, it's 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 a trope of all autocrats. And, you know, what worries me most, actually, in this situation is that um, he Trump is incredibly talented and successful at steering the conversation. Here we are talking about whether Antifa is involved, but uh, right. which is something that, in a way, we shouldn't even be engaging with. But um, but it was uh, what was what I found very disturbing was governors and the mayors of uh, of American cities, Democratic mayors of American cities, people who used to be known as progressive Democrats like Bill de Blasio and Jacob Frey, the mayor of Minneapolis, buying into this sort of outside agitator trope immediately without questioning, saying mm-hmm. that people who don't belong there are um, are protesting as though there were a right to political action that were confirmed, conferred on the basis of where you're, uh, you're renting an apartment, as though we didn't all have a stake in the police regimes that exist in this country. This unquestioning use of, of fundamentally anti-democratic tropes, and of course, unquestioning use of fundamentally anti-democratic tactics like the curfew in New York, is absolutely terrifying because we're finding ourselves in a situation where the conversation is about matters of degree of crackdown. Right? The mayor of New York mm. is willing to crack down to a certain level, and the and the president of the country wants to crack down to an even mm. greater level. That's a really, really good point. Uh, Masha's new book, which is fantastic, like uh, so much of Masha's writing, Surviving Autocracy. Ma- Masha Gessen, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chris.